So today we're going to talk about plant, path, uh, plant pathogens. Uh, this is basically pests, but they're the smaller kinds of pests, when we're, whether we're talking about uh, fungi or fungi-like organisms, or whether we're talking about bacteria or viruses, we're talking about the organisms that cause what we normally, what we normally call uh, plant diseases. We've already talked about three of these. We talked about the coffee rust, which is caused by a fungus. We talked about the, the potato fam, the uh, pot potato disease, which caused the famine in Ireland, which is a fungal-like organism. It's not really a fungus, but more or less. And then we talk about the, uh, the sooty mold in the, in the French grape, which caused huge problems. Oh, uh, this is uh, just another photo of what the actual uh, potato, potato disease looks like. Uh, it is an oomycetes, oomycetes, and has a very, very long evolutionary lineage, uh, and, but it's really quite different than fungi from an evolutionary point of view. It explains to some extent why fungicides frequently don't, don't work on it. Uh, and here we have uh, bacterial, bacterial disease of, of apple trees. You can see the lesions in the, in the bark of the tree, and a bacterial disease of, uh, of, of uh, of uh, uh, a legume here. And in general, these are the kinds of organisms that we're going to talk about that cause the, 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 that cause the diseases that we see uh, that, uh, that plague farmers the world over and something that needs to be incorporated into the whole agroecological paradigm. Now, there are a variety of ways of classifying uh, uh, plant disease systems. Um, <clears throat> depending on depending on your point of view, really, uh, you can focus on the symptoms, uh, so that you talk about blights or rusts or smuts, or things like that, which is based on what the what the, the appearance of the of the uh, of the disease on the plant actually actually is like. You can talk about the host itself, so you can talk about the you know corn smut or the coffee rust or or the tomato curly cob virus. Uh, those are referred to the plant, to the species of species of plant that's being attacked. You can focus on the organism. Uh, excuse me. You can focus on the organ that's being attacked. You can talk about fruit diseases or leaf diseases or uh, root diseases or bark diseases, for that matter. And also, you can focus on transmission type, whether you have a direct transmission like you do in the coffee rust, or whether you have indirect transmission as you do in the, <clears throat> the curly leaf top uh, tomato disease that I talked about last time. Now there are certain uh, generalizations that we can make about diseases and one of the most useful it seems to me is this uh, elementary idea of the disease triangle. So there are three elements when you try to think of a disease as a system, uh, not just as an organism or a series of symptoms or Tr troubles for a particular crop, but rather as a system that works all together. What you have is you have the, uh, the host itself, which is the plant, the crop, uh, whatever you're trying to produce. You have the pathogen, the organism that's a pathogen, and then you have the environment within, within which the whole thing operates. In terms of the pathogen itself, uh, there are two, two aspects. We, we, we can consider the pathogen as, as, uh, as, as having these two aspects. One is the transmissibility. How does it how does the pathogen get from one organism to another, or from one region to another, from one farm to another farm, et cetera? And then, of course, the pathogenicity. What does the organism do to the plant once it actually infects the plant? Sometimes it's very severe. Sometimes there are mild symptoms. Sometimes just reducing production a little bit. Sometimes killing the entire plant. Uh, then we have the, the host itself. And the host itself, uh, sometimes we deal with, uh, the way we deal with plant pathogens is by looking at genetic constructs that are resistant to the pathogen itself. Uh, the development of res resistant varieties has been very, uh, uh, very important in the, in, in, the, in the history of trying to deal with plant, plant pathogens. Um, and we'll see, uh, we'll see, and I'll talk just, just in just a moment about the way the development of resistant varieties is, is similar in principle to what we think about in vaccinations when we talk about human populations. Uh, the second aspect of the, the host itself is the, the question of the, the health of the plant. It's frequently thought that uh, plants which would have a, plants, are more, plants that are more healthy, that they're well, 
well supplied with nutrients and water and growing well and everything, those are more more resistant to uh, to pathogens, which uh, seems to be seems to be true. Although, as we saw in the last lecture, uh, there are situations where that might not be true. I mean, pathogens like insects might actually prefer plants that are uh, that are doing very well. So this, there could be this balance between a very healthy plant protecting itself from pathogens and the, the, and the, and the bigger pests also, uh, a balance between that and the fact that a growing healthy plant is a really good target for either a pathogen or some other kind of pest. Finally, we have the environment. And <clears throat> we can basically divide environments up into two categories, environments that are conducive for the, for the pathogen and environments that are not conducive for, a path, for the pathogen. And as we study the pathogen system, as we study the disease system, uh, we also need to study the environment and potential environments that might, might exist uh, as a part of the strategy for dealing with uh, whatever disease system that we're concerned with. I'm going to use the coffee leaf rust as kind of an example of, uh, of the complications of, the, of, of a pathogen. The reason I'm using that is because I have personally been involved in doing research on the coffee, uh, the coffee rust disease in, in Mexico and Puerto Rico for the past uh, 20 years. And so, well, I think I know quite, quite a bit about it. At least, uh, at least I've been thinking about it for quite a long time. Let me begin with a, a little bit of the history. Um, it was in the mid 19th century, as I mentioned in, a le in the last lecture, that it was first noticed in Ceylon, or what today we call Sri Lanka. Then it was called a British, a British colony, uh, Ceylon. Uh, a botanist by the name of Henry Marshall Ward was so, was uh, sent to Ceylon by the by the British government to figure out how to solve this disease. And what Ward did actually, what Ward did some really brilliant work. He was the one that that figured out what the life cycle was, figured out how it actually infected plants, what it did when it got into the coffee. Uh, <clears throat> so everything I'm gonna tell you about his life history in just a moment, actually that came from, from Ward, but he, he was actually uh, uh, called back to Britain because he was thought to be a failure because uh, he didn't find a, quote, solution to the problem. Now, the, the thing is, it, it, the disease absolutely decimated the coffee industry in in, uh, in Ceylon at the time, and the the coffee industry in Ceylon was kind of the British way of doing a, a more modern system of agriculture. It was a monoculture. They constructed uh, rail rail uh, railroads all over the all over the island, and it had uh, the complete deforestation. Had coffee absolutely everywhere. A monoculture of coffee grew, sort of set it up to be attacked by some sort of a disease. And certainly it did get attacked by the, by the disease. Not only Ceylon, but also South India, Sumatra, Java, South Asia entirely was really, really decimated by this disease. Now, knowing that it was decimated, how it was decimated, uh, coffee farmers in the Americas were, <laughs> were justifiably upset when they heard that it had arrived in the Americas. And especially when it arrived in Brazil, which of course is the, was the major uh, center of coffee production, then it was growing to be the major center of coffee production, then people got totally freaked out. And I was, I was, living, um, uh, I was living for a couple of years uh, at, during that time in, in Nicaragua, and I do remember that the coffee farmers basically were completely paranoid about what was going to happen. I guess justifiably so, no, because they all knew what did happen in South Asia. So they, we did see the arrival of paranoia in Central America, at the time that it, just after it arrived in, in Brazil. Now, it turned out that it never became the kind of a problem that people so, were so worried about. Uh, that is, it was a problem. Nobody liked it. Uh, nobody wanted to have the coffee rust on their farm, but it really didn't decimate the coffee industry in Central America like it devastated the, devastated the coffee industry in South Asia uh, before. And so it became some you know, problem uh, kind of a nuisance more than a real big problem. Uh, and this was the time when I would argue that this is exactly the kind of uh, example uh, I, I was talking about before when I talked about studying things that are not problems. Now, obviously, we knew at the time that from, you know, from the, from the late 70s, uh, 70s on 
that the coffee rust presented a huge potential crisis uh, for the coffee industry of Central America and Mexico. Uh, but that's the point at which we should have figured, we should have tried to figure out why it wasn't a problem. How come it did not live up to its reputation? Um, that wasn't done, um, but that's a beautiful example of how, uh, I think it's a beautiful example of the, of the attitude that we should be trying to cultivate in agroecology, that is studying things that are not problems. Well, anyway, it wasn't a particular problem in Central America until the 2012-2013 season when all of a sudden the rust exploded. It was international news. Uh, it was a really big thing. Uh, Small-scale farmer, coffee farmers in, in Honduras and Guatemala, for example, many of them lost their farms. Uh, these are, that was part of the so-called migra migratory exodus out of those countries towards the United States. Many of those, many of those who were trying to migrate to the United States were former coffee farmers who absolutely who lost their land. Um, it was a big thing. It was, uh, it was, the, 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 even the United States invested a huge amount of money to try to help coffee farmers in Central America and, and Southern Mexico. It was, it, at that point, it exploded and it was a really big deal. So let's, uh, let's talk just a little, a little bit about the basic dy dynamics of the disease, exactly how the disease operates. Um, <clears throat> as you can see here, uh, the spores uh, germinate on the uh, undersurface of the leaf and the germinating spore enters through the somata and it enters the leaves and then the mycelia of the fungus grow intercellularly between the cells and they form these haustorias. The haustoria is the organ that sort of zaps up the uh, energy and materials out of each, each individual cell in the leaf. And then when it's mature, why it goes back to the stomata, it, it exits the stomata and forms these structures that contain the new spores. They're called uridospores. And those uridospores then get taken away by the wind or the water or by touching other plants, those are the dispersal mechanisms that we know about, and the whole cycle starts all over again. Reflecting back on the disease triangle, one of the, uh, one of the elements of the disease triangle is the environment, okay? Now, the way the coffee is produced, especially in Central America and Mexico, but all other places in the world also, is produced in a wide variety of ways. There are two videos playing right here. The video on the left uh, is uh, I'm walking through the, one of the coffee farms that we work on in Mexico. This is a more or less traditional farm. It has a lot, quite a, quite a lot of quite a number of shade trees in it. Uh, it's what we refer to usually as a as a shade coffee farm. The one on the right, uh, less so. The one on the right has very little shade, and you can see the difference between the two of them. If you notice the traditional one, the the video on the left right there, the the coffee trees themselves are kind of spread out. They're not really touching one another very much. The one on the right, you see that they're very densely planted so that they're touching one another. So you can kind of imagine, you know, with, with, uh, with the, the, for, for, the, for the sun coffee, the, one, the, the video on the right, uh, what you have is you have very little, very little cover on top of the coffee trees so that spores that are coming in from the air can quite easily enter into the farm. Whereas the video on the left, which is the more traditional one, while you can imagine that the spores would have, uh, would be blocked at least a little bit because the, the, the tree cover over, the overstory tree cover is gonna limit the, limit the amount of air circulation, uh, et cetera. You can kind of imagine those, those things operative. The big graph on the left, uh, the big graph on the left is a classical graph now, illustrating the sort of the range of production systems uh, that exist. This particular uh, graph was made for Mexico. Uh, Mogul and Toledo were the uh, original uh, <coughs> authors of this, of this graph. And you can see that coffee is grown in, in Mexico, and I would say this, this graph applies to the rest of the world also. Coffee is grown in a range of situations from what some people refer to as rustic coffee, the one on the top, and that is basically the natural forest where the Farmer goes into the natural forest, uh, eliminates a lot of the understory plants, coffee in the understory. So it's rustic in the sense that the shade cover is basically the shade cover of the original forest. 
Uh, then you go down to the sort of the traditional polyculture and that's some of the trees are you know remnant trees from the original forest others are planted specifically as shade for the coffee and then you get down to a uh, commercial polyculture commercial polyculture has usually a variety of shade trees but most of them are planted as opposed to remnants from a tropical forest uh, down to the monoculture of shade when i say monoculture of shade we don't really mean just one species but sort of one type uh, <clears throat> one type of shade tree either a nitrogen producing shade tree or um, or some other convenient, uh, convenient species. And then finally you get to the fully, quote, modern system, the industrialized system, the, 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 the sun coffee system. Uh, the, 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 the videos on the, on the right more or less uh, correspond to, uh, I would guess, something between a traditional polyculture and a commercial polyculture, the one on the, the video on the left and the video on the right, somewhere between monocultural shade and sun coffee, more aiming I, I guess more, more towards the sun coffee side of it. Now, part of the dynamics of the disease is, is that it's, it, 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 it spreads just like a disease, just like a human disease spreads from person to person, in this case, from coffee bush to coffee bush. Uh, now, it comes from the outside, for sure, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, but right, right now, as it comes out from the outside, why well, it infects a certain number of bushes, sort of independently of whether their neighbors have been affected or not. Este, and so, in this particular case, for example, we have uh, five, uh, five of the trees were infest, infested from the outside. But based on whether the trees are close to one another, in this case, I put a, sort of 
in this cartoon version, I put them kind of touching one another. So the ones that are touching one another, those are the ones that are going to spread the infection so that we see how the infection gets spread locally. Uh, there's a combination of the regional and the local. Now we're going to talk about a little bit about the regional. Here we see uh, four images. These are images from, from Google Earth. And you can see the top two images are from Puerto Rico, the bottom two images are from Mexico, and Mexico is sort of in the general area where I've been doing, I've been doing my research. And you can see that the, the, at, the, at the landscape level, the, the, the level of uh, the, the, the overall landscape level, you can see it's highly variable. You get a certain amount of forest cover, uh, sort of right in the middle of each of those slides, there's a coffee farm. Uh, the bottom ones you might not notice that there's a coffee farm there, but there is. The top ones you can see there's a slightly uh, more variability in the landscape. Um, <clears throat> now here uh, is, uh, I'm going to tell you about a study that was done in Costa Rica by Jack Avellino and his group at uh, Katia in Costa Rica. And what they did was they took uh, individual coffee farms and they drew circles around them. And then within the circles that they drew around them, they categorized what the vegetation was. Um, the details are important for our purposes here, but they had different cat they had a different um, measure of what the landscape variability was at different levels of of, of uh, examining the landscape around each of a bunch of different farms. This was all in one province in Costa Rica when they did this, and this was before the big rust, this was before the 2012 epidemic of rust when it hit. Here's a map of, uh, with the, of, the, of, of the study areas that they had. Uh, you can see they're, they're all, around the, all around that whole province. And here is a graph of their results. And what you can see in this graph is really fairly, fairly spectacular. This is just for pasture. Uh, and it, it, when you say pasture here, it's very similar for sun coffee. Uh, so you could think of this graph as uh, representing sun coffee and pasture together. Okay, that is a deforested area. And you see somewhere between, between 50 meters and 380 meters or so, approximately there, those triangles that are shaded indicate triangles that indicate results that are statistically significant. You know, and what you see is you see the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient is the correlation between the landscape factor and the amount of rust that exists on a, on, on a coffee farm. So what you see here is that at the level of about, you know, 200 meters, let's say, uh, around 200 meters, a circle around 200 meters in diameter, what you have is you have a very, very high correlation that's above 40% above correlation between how much pasture is there is in an area and how much rust you get. So think about that. I mean, the, the amount of pasture or the amount of deforestation that you have in an area really is highly correlated. In this particular study, it's highly correlated with the amount of rust that's on a particular farm. Now, I emphasize this was done before the big rust, before the 2012 epidemic. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the, the results are pretty strong. And they do suggest that uh, there's something associated with cover, that is tree cover, whether it's uh, neighboring forests or whether it's the tree cover, cover in, the plant, in, in the coffee farm itself, that has to do with the rust. That is, a lack of cover means more rust. So what, what we can say from the, from the last, couple of, last couple of narratives that I was, that I was giving you, we can, we can say that on the one hand, yes, there is regional transmission, regional meaning that the spores are coming in from the general region, not just on your own farm. But we can also say that there is local transmission. So we, really, there's quite a bit of evidence indicating that both of those things are true. Well, if both of those things are true, what does that imply? Well, we engage in a little bit of uh, theoretical modeling uh, uh, about this. And if you just conceive of the process, conceive of the disease system, as operating at a regional level and at a local level. That is at the region as a whole from farm to farm, spores are going from farm to farm, but then within a, within a farm, spores are moving from bush to bush, uh, depending on what the underlying conditions are. So we have the level of the region, we have the level of the farms. And so we looked at, we tried to look at what are the expected outcomes 
if you just make the simple assumptions that you have these two different transmission scales, one regional, one local, what does that imply for the spread of the disease itself? I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll um, <clears throat> not subject you to uh, a presentation of exactly what the model, uh, the model says analytically, but I think I can explain what it says using kind of a cartoon version here. In this cartoon right here, we have, uh, we have the, uh, the you know, consider it as five different farms with different levels of shade, or consider it as the same farm going through five different time sequences, getting more and more deforested. So uh, the farm on the, the one on the image on the left and the farm on the left, uh, what we have is we have, you know, 100% shade cover and zero rust disease. Okay, that's the way we start. Now, as we increase the deforestation, what happens is the upper canopy, the canopy above the, above the coffee is opened up to the spores that might come in from the from the from 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 above and furthermore as the the, uh, the 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 farms themselves are infested with the with the with the rust why they're producing spores and those spores then they ascend to the to the atmosphere if they're covered with a uh, with an overstory that you know sort of blocks them it creates kind of a, a barrier to them while you have less getting out getting up into the into the atmosphere so you can see how in this framework you can see how going from uh, full full canopy cover uh, in the farm to zero canopy in the cover in the farm goes from zero rust disease to a hundred percent infected with rust uh, here is a graph uh, this graph basically shows the same the same data as you go from uh, from zero percent shade cover to a hundred percent shade cover it's going kind of in the opposite direction from the cartoon but as you go from no shade cover to 100% shade cover, your rust infection goes from 100% down to 0% with the pattern that you see here. This cartoon shows more or less the same thing, but going in the opposite direction, beginning with a deforested area and now presuming that we're having a program of reforestation, either reforestation of the general area around the farm or reforestation of the farm, putting a canopy cover back, in, back into the farm. And you see, well, the, basically, the reverse thing happens. Uh, what you're getting is you're getting a, a, a blockage of the, of a continual blockage as you reforest, more and more of a blockage of the rust spores coming in from the outside, and more of a blockage of the rust spores going up from the farm to get into the, into the general pool of rust spores in the, in, in the atmosphere. Making the same kind of graph, going from zero canopy cover to uh, uh, zero shade cover to 100% shade cover. You can see what's ha what happens to the roya, with the, to, to the rust, excuse me. <coughs> it goes from 100% down to 0%. But notice that the pattern is slightly different. Now you put those two final graphs together, like here, and you see that there's a different pattern depending on whether you go from full canopy cover to no canopy cover, or from no canopy cover to full canopy cover you get a different stage at which the rust becomes under control or becomes an epidemic, one or the other. I'd like to present basically the same idea, but in a slightly more generalized sense, and this doesn't apply to just this particular, uh, particular model. Uh, this is well known in ecology now, this, the basic pattern that I'm gonna show you right now. Uh, we go from, uh, th this is a, a graph of the uh, environmental change and the environmental change we're talking about in the case in the case of the rust is the the shade in the coffee farm uh, and then of course the pathogen on the on the y-axis and we can imagine changing that environment moving <coughs> having the pathogen load decrease 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 up to a point where boom all of a sudden it it, it, it goes to zero that's as we change the environment going from the left to the right from small to large, whatever the measure of the environment happens to be. Now what happens if we do it in the other direction, what we may find is going from right to left, why once again, we have no rust, no rust, no rust, that's what the red line indicates, and then all of a sudden it jumps up to be a, a, a very heavy infection, to be an epidemic again. These kinds of jumps are formally known as critical transitions. It's a, 
the whole field of studying critical transitions and trying to predict when critical transitions are going to happen is now a really uh, kind of a hot button issue in the science of ecology. Uh, it's being applied all over in ecology and you can, I hope you can see here where it really applies very, very clearly to uh, the situation of the, of the disease. Um, the other aspect of this is, and the way this particular disease, the way this modeling of the disease operates is that you have these two critical transitions and in between the two critical transitions, you see you can have, uh, you have another, um, another line that you can draw and that line represents uh, kind of a dividing line, sort of a peak uh, a peak where the, the system might be situated right on top of that peak and it's balanced there and can go either this way or this way. It can go either up to epidemic or it can go down to zero. And those are, those are a series of unstable points. The dashed red line indicates where the unstable points are located in this system. Now, the, 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 this kind of framework where you have these two critical transitions with the zone in between where it could be one or the other. You have alternative equilibrium points really. You have one with a disease at the epidemic with the other with no disease at all. That referred to a zone of hysteresis. It, uh, again, that's part of the whole field in ecology uh, referred to critical transitions. Hysteresis is all part of the same ball game. Now, how does that uh, apply to the, the real world? Well, maybe it does, maybe not. It's hard really hard to say, but here we have a graph of what did happen on one of the farms that we are doing research on in Mexico. And as you can see from the outbreak, the initial outbreak in 2013, 2014, what we have is uh, uh, it's, it's a seasonal, seasonal disease of course, so the little oscillations that you see represent the seasons of it. And you can see the peak, uh, the peak was very high first of all, and then the next two are relatively low and the next one is relatively low also, and then uh, <clears throat> a couple more are relatively low. But then watch what happens as we go to the present day. You see, boom, all of a sudden it's had disappeared. This pattern looks very much like the pattern described in the model that I, uh, that I presented to you, and, and very much like the pattern of a critical transition. Now, uh, are we facing the, the prospect of, are we facing the prospect of of a hysteresis that was a critical transition to right now that farm is in relatively good state with regard to the coffee rust, but that, that does that imply that uh, <clears throat> something could happen where it would go back, but at a kind of a different level of environmental management. Now, let me be clear about this particular case. Uh, there was no change in the shade cover. That was how the original model was, was, work, was working here, but the environmental transformation in this particular case seems to have been the planting of resistant varieties. Now, resistant varieties in <clears throat> plant pathology, let's, 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 recall, let's recall what those actually represent. Resistant varieties are sort of like vaccinated individuals, right? The reason you vaccinate individuals with a human disease is because you want so-called so -called herd immunity. You want the basic reproductive rate to be less than one, right? And that you can actually calculate how many people have to be uh, vaccinated for that to happen. Well, putting, uh, sort of planting uh, resistant varieties in your farm is basically planting vaccinated individuals in the farm. So that the transmission from bush to bush on a farm, uh, the average transmission then goes down because your average infected bush is more likely in, to encounter a resistant individual next to it is if the resistant individuals are planted there. So what had been happening on this farm is ever since the, ever since the big outbreak, why they had been progressively planting resistant varieties uh, in the farm. And that perhaps, my hypothesis is that's what caused this apparent uh, critical transition. Now, ex expanding just a little bit on, on, on um, the, the principles, I think, which, which, are, which demonstrate general principles about plant pathology, looking at the, looking at the coffee, coffee lease rust as an example. Uh, let's go back to the disease triangle and remember that it has these three components to it, the host, the pathogen, and the environment. 
Uh, and we can see how all three of those things were involved in the, the history now of the coffee rust, probably stemming from, uh, from Sri Lanka or Ceylon to, to Mexico uh, and, and later on. But also, remember now we talked about these other kinds of diseases also. This is the, this is the curly top virus, which is, which is uh, vectored by this leafhopper that I talked about last time. Now, when you have these uh, non-direct or indirect transmission processes going on, uh, things become really complicated, don't they? And the opportunities become, com be become complicated also. And the opportunities become, become large because we might be talking about the possibility of uh, intervening in the population dynamics of the leafhopper itself. That is the vector. We might, uh, we might talk about either the host, the pathogen, or the environment, any, any three of the, any of the three faces of the disease triangle, but each one of those faces now uh, contains the pathogen itself, the pathogen organism, and the vector of the pathogen organism. So we have enormous complications here that allow us for all sorts of possibility for ecological control of the system, ecological management of the system, if we can understand the way it works in detail for, ed, for any particular system. Let me close this lecture uh, just by citing this, uh, this paper by Jeffrey Bentley, who in, um, in, in the 80s, in the uh, mid 80s, why he did a whole series of uh, interviews with a bunch of Honduran farmers in general. And he talked to them about, um, about, about, uh, about the enemies of their, of their crops. And he was talking to them about uh, insect enemies and as well as plant pathogens, right? And he, uh, he published this, this piece uh, in the Journal of uh, Agriculture and Human Values, and he notes that traditional Central American peasant farmers know more about some agents of the local agroecosystem than about others, more about plants, less about insects, and less still about plant pathology. Um, <clears throat> and the title of this article I, I find really, uh, really interesting and sort of a slogan that uh, agroecologists, that we in the agroecological movement uh, have really ought to, uh, ought, ought to consider seriously, and that is what farmers don't know can't help them. And that's, a, I think that's a, ni a, a nice way of putting it. Uh, <clears throat> the job of the agroecologists in terms of plant uh, diseases, in terms of plant pathology, uh, should be to try to help farmers understand uh, the dynamics of the disease and all the complexities. And what that requires, of course, is for us to understand the complexities of those disease systems, which I hope I've convinced you, uh, at least a little bit in this lecture, can be really quite complicated.